Welcome to Book Talk. We're seeing the birth of a whole new genre of political books. Books that seek to explain what's gone wrong with our economy and our politics, and to identify who's to blame, and indeed to suggest what to do next. And among the latest is Meltdown by Professor Stephen Hazler, which essentially pins the blame for the credit crunch and the economic crisis on hubris, resulting with horrible inevitability in our current nemesis. And you trace this back, Stephen, to a, a moment at the fall of the Berlin Wall, where, as it were, a rush of blood seemed to overwhelm Western leaders. Yes, I think it did. Before the fall of the wall, when we had a, a bipolar system, Russia, Mar and America. Russia and America, we, the argument was, and I think it's a, a reasonable one, that capitalism was relatively contained and still fairly social in its outlook. The minute the Berlin Wall came down and we had a global economy then to exploit and to work in, the, uh, the argument became that um, corporations, uh, capital, could spread around the world, could make huge profits, all of a sudden, uh, profits unthought of before, with money unthought of before, funny money unthought of before. And the basic, my argument is the Western leaders, which at the time were Clinton, Blair, New Labour, as much as the conservative uh, people, the Republicans, saw this as a huge opportunity to remake the world, to allow their Western companies to make big profits, and for them to remake the world in the West's image. It all went to their heads. They thought they were masters of the universe, not just the Wall Street people, but the politicians as well. And it, as I try and argue in the book, this is the basis of this huge bubble we've had, is the fundamental political underpinnings of the huge bubble, which has ended, of course, in Iraq uh, and in the collapse of the financial capitalist system. It's, a, it's an unbelievable story. And some of the, the, the villains of the piece are this new superclass of billionaires with no particular ties to a particular nation state, people who move their billions to safe havens to the highest possible interest yes. all the time. You, you assign them quite a large part in this. Well, I think basically the, it was a huge opportunity presented to make a lot of money. And without the constraints, and I think this is the key point, without the constraints of politics, regulation, and the democratic process. Because when you, the minute you had a global economy, you didn't have any global governance. There was no global governance, global polity to regulate it, to look after it, to limit it. And so this generally was a new limitless world, a sort of huge new Wild West, which um, the, the super, this new super class, the super rich class, took huge advantage of, and we saw it in the high levels of inequality that uh, that um, developed in the Western world. I mean, I was looking at this in the 1990s and suddenly discovered, while all the politicians and economists were telling us, great economic, what marvelous economy we have, onward and upwards, economic growth, unbelievable. At the same time, I noticed inequality beginning in the Western world. Many people at the lower end of this, not participating in the gold rush, were finding they had to work two jobs, they had limits on their income. And so I think this is a major part of the story, that the growth of inequality was linked to this, this gold rush. And part of that was that the, the, the traditional middle class, the experience was that they weren't really that out of range of being quite rich. And suddenly they were out of range of, of this super class that you described yes. as sort of the international multi-billionaire investor class. This has been the um, social aspect of it that has led to the present crisis, the, the, the war on the middle class in a way, or the fracturing of the middle class. During the 90s, early part of the, 20th se uh, of the 21st century, these, the middle class could go two ways. One section went up into the, or began to touch the big money, but the majority of the middle class were actually sinking in their social position. And this fracturing of the middle class now, I think, is the heart of this crisis. <coughs> uh, we've lost the consensus behind international capitalism now, global capitalism. Middle class, if we take the American example, you have to ask yourself, how does a black, liberal, stream, quite, quite ra a liberal president the mo with the most, most liberal voting record, how does a, a, a guy like Barack Obama actually win an American presidential contest? Unthinkable before. Thinkable now because the middle class are really up against it and looking for radical changes, which he represents. And I believe the same is happening in this country too, but I think we're a bit of a time lag here. 
And, and part of that, I suppose, is because the, uh, the super class that we've been talking about has stopped being the aspirational figures and have started being the villains of the piece. I mean, you link them very strongly to the speculative bubble that's now burst, that's wreaking such havoc in the world economy. Yes. Um, uh, the, 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 there's no longer the old capitalist system whereby, or the old capitalist values, he made money the, you know, by hard work, innovation, creativity. Now, there's not much creativity about this. This is just sitting on capital and shoveling it around the world, uh, often through the carry trade, often through um, uh, moving between one regulatory system and another, which is quite easy to do. You know, it's not difficult to be a very big-time capitalist now. Could politicians have ever damned, stopped, moderated this process? Because, you, I mean, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, Alan Greenspan, the head of the US Federal Reserve for much of this period, get a very bad press in your book. Could they actually ever have stopped this or even well, ameliorated it? I look at the career of Bill Clinton and Blair, which I consider to be very similar. These are men of the left, ostensibly. There are men of the left who come into politics in the 90s, Clinton at the beginning, Blair at the end. What are they talking about? They, if you look at their language, they're talking about equality, they're talking about modernity, they're talking about meritocracy. They come in and they basically do a deal with the super rich class. I mean, I think that's what fundamentally happened. Uh, and I, I, my argument was they didn't have to. But they did. Uh, and. Uh, in a way, that is what's now caused the problems for New Labour, because New Labour made its Faustian bargain with these guys. What was the bargain, then? We'll not tax you. We'll not deal with the whole problem of inequality that's growing. We'll be, and to use the famous term, supremely relaxed about very rich people. Uh, in return for that, well, I don't know what they get in return for that. In return for that, um, we'll govern and we'll maybe have some liberal developments on the social front and maybe a little, if you look at Tony Blair's regime. But, but didn't they also get the money of the super rich being invested in the country? Well, some of it. And the argument was that if you don't attract the super rich in, you, it doesn't help your tax receipts. There's a little bit of that in it, yes. And there was, there was that kind of argument, of course. But it couldn't last. And so let's just imagine for a moment that uh, the country comes to its senses and sweeps you to power. You're Prime Minister Hazel, oh. what's your first hundred days? How do you get from here to there? What do we do? <laughs> a great question. I like that kind of great. Well, I think um, my own argument is that I think that we have a crisis of sterling at the moment, and that's symptomatic of a deeper crisis in the country. I think the only solution, potential solution for us, is to integrate ourselves in our near neighbour, the European Union. We are a member of the European Union, after all. A semi-detached member. Yes, but we're not a 51st state. But it's not and a if desperately you popular proposition, no, it is it? it Europe isn't. is not a, a popular cause in this country. If there was a referendum on uh, Europe at the moment, I, I don't know, a lot of polls suggest we might get out of it. The reason Europe is not popular in, amongst the British is because we've sold ourselves a bill of goods over the last 10 to 15 years that our economy is magnificent that we've adopted the American model, the Europeans are sclerotic, the European model itself has been introduced in this country. But the American model is the wrong model, it's, it's, it's collapsing, we can see that now. So I think we are on the cusp of a quite major public opinion shift, not only away from the American capitalist model towards a more social model, which I think is the social European model, but I think we'll find as well that the European debate will come back into uh, into play in this country. It has to. There's going to be a fortress created uh, in Europe and in the United States. And we've got to go into one or the other of them. We can't exist in the global economy. The global economy has collapsed. Well, the global economy, you, uh, and again, you're very tough on globalization in this book, is something we've all been told we've got to adapt to. Can we now just pull the plug, run into a protectionist block in Europe. It's a bit like trying to unscramble an egg, isn't it? Everybody ends up much poorer if you clamp down on world trade, surely. Oh, I think people are going to be poorer because of the collapse in the system. I think there's no question about that. But I think that the way to mitigate the, not the poverty that's coming, but the discomfort that's coming is within these big continent states. In other words, the United States is big enough to cope with this. The European economy, by and large, is big enough to cope with this. But we're outside. We're outside of both. And we have a mentality that puts us outside of both, too. So I think we have to adapt to the European issue as a way of saving ourselves, frankly, in, this, in these circumstances.